Okay, so this is a tutorial on the parts of the brain. So this is a basic tutorial and I want to give you an overview of the different parts that make up the brain. So there's not going to be huge amounts of detail here, but this is just a tutorial to sort of orientate yourself um, with regard to structures of the brain. So we'll start off by looking at the brain stem. So first of all, I'll just point out what we're looking at here. We're looking at a side view of the brain. Anterior is this side, posterior is this side, um, and obviously superior and inferior. So you can sort of see the see the brain, how it sits there. So I'm just going to rotate it around and we'll take a look at the brain stem. So I've just res removed some of the nerves to make it a bit more clearer. So the brain stem is this bit here and it consists of three parts. You've got the medulla oblongata, the pons and the midbrain. So the medulla oblongata is this bit here which um, is uh, most distal or m most inferior and it starts at the end of the pons and it ends where the spinal cord begins. So the spinal cord begins at the um, opening of the skull, at the foramen magnum, and this is where the medulla oblongata ends. So just above it you've got the pons, which is this bit here, and above the pons you've got the midbrain. So what I'm going to do is just isolate the brain stem. So I've just removed all the other structures. We're looking at the exact same view. You've got the medulla at the bottom, the pons and the midbrain above it. So the midbrain is this this region here. Um, and it consists of, so at the front, you've got these um, bits which are called cerebral peduncles. And at the back, you've got these little sort of hills. And these are called um, the corpora quadrigemina. And uh, this is Latin for quadruplet bodies, because uh, obviously there's four four little um, bumps. So the top ones are called superior colliculi, and the bottom two are called inferior colliculi. And the word colliculi is Latin for um, lower hills because of their appearance. Um, so the, these colliculi sit on the tectum. So the tectum is sort of the roof of the midbrain. So tectum means roof in Latin. So these um, corpora quadrigemina sit on the tectum of the midbrain. So the midbrain is this structure here. You've got the um, cerebral peduncles and you've got the tectum with the four um, colliculi. So in the midbrain, you've got loads of nuclei. So nuclei are um, collections of cell bodies which are contained in the nervous system, in the, sorry, in the central nervous system, whereas ganglia are um, collections of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So in the brainstem there's lots of nuclei which are important for controlling functions like heart rate and blood pressure um, and respiration, as well as things like the level of consciousness um, and wakefulness and arousal. And then you've got lots of cranial nerve nuclei um, and nuclei related to the cerebellum, which I'm just about to show you. So I've just switched back to this model, uh, model and I'll just show you the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is this, this uh, part of the brain which sits behind the brainstem. So you can see it here sitting directly behind the brainstem. And you can see it's, it has these two lobes. So the cerebellum means little brain in Latin. Um, and this has loads of connections with the brainstem and it's important in motor control um, and coordination, balance and muscle tone and that sort of thing. So if I remove the cerebellum, you can, and I'll just remove the hemispheres as well, so we can see the midbrain here, so you can identify them by these, um, the colliculi. Um, so that's the midbrain sitting, and you can see, well this is the dorsal surface of the um, uh, brainstem. So the next part of the brain that we need to talk about is called the diencephalon. And this is the part of the brain that sits on top of the midbrain. And it consists of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pineal body. Um, or the pineal gland, which it is also called. So I've just removed the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum. And we're looking at um, the back of the brainstem. So remember you can see the midbrain here, which is easy to notice. And then below you've got them. Um, the pons and the medulla oblongata. So the midbrain is sitting just above this. So you can see this paired structure, these paired spher sort of not spherical, these oval 
uh, roundish structures. These are called the thalami, um, and they're, they're, you've got two two thalamus, two thalami, so one on each side, and they're joined at the middle via the interthalamic adhesion. Um, so just below the thalamus, you've got the hypothalamus, which is a little bit smaller. Um, so the hypothalamus sits here. So I've just uh, got rid of a few of those structures. So you can see the, the oval-shaped thalamus and the hypothalamus below it. And at the back, um, just here, you've got the pineal gland. So the thalamus is a really important structure to know about because it essentially acts as a switchboard or a gateway um, to the cerebral hemisphere. So it relays connections to the cerebral hemisphere, uh, to the cerebral cortex um, of the cerebral hemispheres. Um, and it contains lots of nuclei. So the thalamus sends and receives um, fibres from the cortex and it's got thalamocortical loops and lots of reciprocal connections. So it's important in um, many things such as sleep, and wakefulness. Um, it's important in coordinating information from uh, the various sensory systems um, and it also has links to the basal ganglia, ganglia which I'll come on to talk about and also the cerebellum. So I've just switched to this lateral view. I've removed various structures so you can visualize the thalamus right in the center very clearly. So you get a lot of fibers projecting into the thalamus and the thalamus coordinates all this information and it projects fibres into the cortex and it also receives fibres back from the cortex. So you'll often hear the thalamus referred to as a relay or a switchboard or a gateway um, for this reason. So the cerebral hemispheres are what most people think of when they think of the brain. Um, so we're looking at these two cerebral hemispheres here. You've got a, um, a right and a left cerebral hemisphere. Um, and the cerebral hemispheres are responsible for higher functions, so thinking, memory, um, consciousness, language, emotion, movement and sensory perception, this, these kinds of things. Um, so the cerebral hemisphere consists of an outer cortex, which is made up of six layers of grey matter, um, and you've got the inner portion of the cerebral hemisphere, which is made up of white matter. So I'm just going to rotate the brain around and I'm going to switch to a diagram uh, to illustrate the cerebral cortex. So if we take a, so imagine just cutting the brain through this axis here. So directly, we're going to take a, um, a slice of the brain down here. So we, we're looking at this cross section of the slice we've just taken. Um, so this is a coronal section. Um, and what I wanted to show you on this um, slice is the cerebral cortex. So the cortex is the outer part of the cerebrum and it is grey matter. So you can see this thin bit on the edge of the cerebrum. Um, this is the cerebral cortex and it consists of up to six layers of neural tissue. So um, the neocortex is where uh, the cortex has six layers. Any other parts with um, less than six layers are um, referred to as the allocortex. Um, and this allocortex can be subdivided into an archicortex and a paleocortex. So these are parts of the cortex with less than six layers. But the neocortex is the one to um, uh, remember because this is the, is the newer, sort of evolutionarily newer part of the cortex and is responsible for higher functions like language and conscious thought. So the neocortex has six layers. So just looking at the outside of the cerebral hemisphere, you can see um, that there's these grooves and you've got um, ridges. So the ridges are called gyri and the grooves are called sulci. And you've got lots of, um, lots of these different grooves and ridges as you can see. Um, and they all have different names. But two important ones to remember are the central sulcus, which I'm showing you here with the arrow, and the lateral sulcus. And I'll do another tutorial which um, goes through all these different grooves and ridges. But the reason I showed you these, um, the, the two sulci, the central sulcus and the lateral sulcus, is because these two sulci can be used to um, separate some functionally important uh, lobes of the brain. So you've got four lobes of the brain which are separated uh, by various grooves. 
So anterior to the central sulcus, which I'm drawing along here, you've got the frontal lobe, because it sits um, behind the frontal bone of the skull. So this is the frontal lobe that I've outlined in red. Posterior to the central sulcus, you've got the parietal lobe, um, and this runs like this. So I'm outlining this in yellow. And this is called the parietal lobe because it lies under the parietal bone. And inferior to the uh, lateral sulcus, which I'm drawing on in green, we've got the temporal lobe. So I'm just outlining the temporal lobe here. And it runs like that. And right at the back, we've got this lobe here called the occipital lobe, which I've just outlined in blue. So this is actually qu this is quite a rough um, illustration of the four lobes, um, but I wanted to show you that the how the central sulcus and the lateral sulcus are important in um, defining these different areas. So anterior to the central sulcus, you've got the frontal lobe. Posterior to it, you've got the parietal lobe, and then you've got the lateral sulcus, which inferior to the lateral sulcus, you've got the temporal lobe. So the frontal lobe is important in decision making, um, problem solving, and planning. The temporal lobe is important in memory, language, emotion and hearing. Um, and the parietal lobe acts as a sort of inter integrator of sensory information, so it receives and processes sensory information. And the occipital lobe um, sitting at the back is responsible for vision. So that's a very crude overview of their functions, but it gives you an idea that different lobes have different functions.